Hello, this is Don Mitchell. It's great to get the chance to have to speak to you again to talk about the 2000% solution. The book that teaches you and your organization how to accomplish at least 20 times more with the same or less time, effort, and resources. Uh, now, engaging this, now we're talking about the eight-step process that you engage in as you eliminate the stalls, the bad thinking habits that have held you back. So in developing these new thinking habits, we have to learn some uh, new uh, ways to perceive things. And perhaps the one that will be most unusual to many people is the subject of chapter 13, identify the theoretical best practice. So you're probably wondering what that is. Well, let me give you an alternative uh, way to describe it. Uh, you can also think of this as the ideal best practice. And in some of the, um, two, the uh, two 400 year projects uh, books on this subject, we, we refer to this as the ideal best practice. So view those as interchangeable definitions. Uh, so what is this? So this is the uh, limit of what technology and human capabilities can accomplish in the next five years with reasonable effort and reasonable risk. And you might think to yourself, well, are people doing that all the time? Well, a few people are, particularly those who are trying to set world records. Uh, but in many cases, uh, they have been stymied uh, by limitations that are artificial. Uh, as we described in the chapter, for example, for many years, people could not pole vault past 14 feet because they were using a stiff pole. As soon as flexible poles were brought into play using more advanced uh, materials, it then became possible to go much higher. Uh, and we see these limitations. Now, there was a time, for example, when uh, athletes who had lost their legs could not compete. And now we have Paralympics where people uh, using uh, composite uh, feet and legs uh, are really r uh, racing along at incredibly high speeds and making for you know, extremely exciting uh, contests uh, that are very heartwarming to watch as well. So in doing this, you might think to yourself, well, gee, but human beings are really not very good at doing things and make lots of mistakes and so forth. Let me point you to uh, the, the material towards the end of the chapter, as well as the information that can be found in the 2000% Solution Workbook with regard to the theoretical or ideal best practice. Uh, in both of those places, we point out with a lot of details uh, ways that um, human beings routinely, both as individuals and as groups, perform almost perfectly. In fact, it's only uh, the fact that we uh, tend to judge ourselves and others so harshly when we don't perform perfectly that we tend to be so much more aware of what we do ineffectively than we are what we do effectively. Now, in building an ideal or theoretical best practice, we obviously want to uh, begin by uh, you know, building on the characteristics that make uh, individuals and organizations perform almost uh, perfectly. Um, and some of those, uh, you know, ingredients include, you know, a strong incentive to do well, uh, taking advantage of natural tendencies and habits and preferences, and lots of practice. Uh, with those three things in place, uh, really quite remarkable results uh, can be had. Uh, and if you're lacking an example, if, if you've ever seen people in the military who get the order to, instead of staying in attention, to relax and be at ease, they have no trouble at all, you know, going from the rigid, uncomfortable posture to the much more comfortable, relaxed, at ease uh, posture. Uh, so put these elements in place as you think about the theoretical best practice. Now, in many cases, you may not know what materials or technologies or software or other uh, ways of thinking might bring to the party. But as you search around, look for places where rather extraordinary results occur. Uh, and then investigate how those results were accomplished. And then think about how those uh, elements uh, could be added 
uh, to what it is you want to do perfectly. Uh, for instance, uh, many people uh, think it's all but impossible to perform complex uh, processes without making lots of errors. Well, if you uh, automate that process uh, and put in backup equipment and software uh, behind that automation to do something that's actually quite routine, such as uh, forwarding emails over an intranet within an organization, I think you'll find that uh, you know the error rate will be extremely small, uh, and this rather complex way of getting uh, messages around will become as natural as uh, saying hi to somebody that you bump into in the hall. So those, uh, so think, so draw on what you see around you. Now, as you think, draw on what you see around you. Put things together for the first time. That's what a lot of people do: is they take one element. Uh, so one element. Uh, might be trying to high jump higher. Uh, okay, well, in trying to high jump higher, they might be maximizing a current technique. And that's a wonderful thing to do to advance the uh, future best practice. But it's probably not the way to get to the ideal or the theoretical best practice. A far better thing to do would be to look at acrobats and gymnasts and other people who leap through the air to see uh, what ways of leaping they use uh, that cause them to create the distance uh, between them and the ground to be the largest. Now, had someone done that, they probably would have noticed that by uh, jumping over backwards, the uh, feet, legs, and arms are uh, pulled away from a high jump bar uh, so that uh, only the head has to actually be sure that it goes neatly over the bar. Well, obviously, it's a lot easier to do that than it is to, to get arms, legs, hands, feet, and all of these things that can bump into the bar in the way. Uh, so as a result, the uh, technique that most people use to reach the highest levels today involves jumping over backwards, much like an acrobat or a gymnast might do in doing a high jump. So notice that in most cases, we're going to have to go into a different field. We have to go from our field into a field where people have already done uh, something much better and see how that can be applied to this field. Another advantage of this, of course, is that in the other field, which may at first seem unrelated, I mean, who thinks of uh, circus uh, gymnasts as having anything at all to do uh, with those who uh, do high jumping in track and field? Uh, you then uh, will uh, find out another way of looking at uh, the potential for human beings. But let's imagine that there's still another way that people could, you know, uh, clear away from the ground to a much greater extent. Uh, we might, uh, to discover this, um, use mechanical means. We might literally uh, have people who are trained athletes of a variety of sorts um, exert pressure against the ground uh, and using a variety of techniques uh, to see how much force is generated. And then by understanding uh, what positions generate the most force, then uh, imagine different ways that force could be projected upward uh, in ways that then would cause a body to go uh, uh, higher in the air uh, versus gravity. Uh, and in, sorry, in thinking about this, then obviously one interesting element would be to think about the fact that uh, gravity has a really a similar effect on uh, everything. In other words, and uh, that was long ago demonstrated at the Leaning Tower of Pisa. If you drop something light and something heavy, uh, wind resistance apart, air, uh, and turbulence as something's dropped, they'll go at the same rate. Uh, so what that suggests, if we want to get really higher off the ground, uh, then perhaps uh, something about the height of a person would be important. However, there's an offset, which is people who are taller uh, might, in fact, uh, you know, have some more issues about coordination, so we'd have to take those into account. But it might be there are certain moves that someone could take um, that they are, uh, while they're taller, that are really actually easier to do. Uh, because uh, you're taller. And the way is that uh, some of the high jump techniques start out by actually acting quite a bit like falling over backwards, uh, I think uh, would be a good indication of that. 
So I've been talking a lot about sports, uh, not because the focus of this book is about sports, it's about making organizations and individuals much more effective. But uh, sports, I think, can be a good analogy, good metaphor uh, for helping us to see what can be done in other areas. Uh, and if we look at most organizations, uh, we see some pretty big gaps. I mean, for example, if I interview the top 15 executives in an organization and ask them what the key uh, targets of the organization are over the next five years, I'll be lucky if anyone other than the one who wrote the targets will be able to remember what they are. Um, so that's an example, obviously, of uh, poor communications. Yet, if I were to ask each person if they knew what their salary was, they would know that uh, very well. They could probably tell me in great detail about that. That's because they're a lot more interested in their salary uh, than in these goals. Now, by tying their salaries more to accomplishing these goals, uh, we could probably increase that awareness of the goals, particularly in being able to state them uh, with no warning, uh, really to a much higher level. Uh, so uh, a lot of times the reason that we're unsuccessful is that we assume that things will work perfectly when in fact and in practice they don't, but we haven't really revealed that. So if we're going to be talking about approaching uh, you know, perfection in essence, uh, what we're going to find is, is that human beings can come pretty close uh, to perfection within the limits. And then increasingly, we find that those uh, limits uh, can be uh, changed. Uh, one of my favorite examples is of things that hadn't been tested I was reported a number of years ago. Um, people who had been bedridden, uh, these are elderly people uh, who, you know, it was felt that they would probably never get out of bed again, uh, were part of an experiment in which they were encouraged to exercise and physical therapists help them regain the ability to walk. And as they gradually became able to walk, they were then encouraged to walk faster. And then they were uh, in, taught how to jog, you know, slowly. They learned to jog faster. And then literally within a few months, these people were able to run pretty long distances, longer distances than I can. So a lot of times we assume away the potential uh, to accomplish a great deal more. Uh, and in making uh, those assumptions, uh, we kind of reveal to ourselves uh, that uh, uh, we are uh, planning to fail rather than planning to succeed. Uh, there's another series of experiments I think are quite interesting. You see in a lot of areas. Uh, we now know that the genes in our bodies um, are not fixed in the sense that they are unchangeable at the broadest level some of them actually adjust to the conditions that we experience. So if we change the conditions in ways uh, that stimulate those genes, in fact, actually our, our literal bodies will be reconstructed uh, in ways that will adapt to that environment, enable us to be more effective. And I, I mentioned that uh, because I think a lot of us uh, forget that uh, almost every part of our body is reconstructed on a regular basis. In other words, those cells that you have on your skin, those uh, cells you have in your blood vessels, the blood itself, and so forth, uh, didn't exist uh, at some point in the past. They were actually recreated by your body. Uh, and so as a result, since we are being made new all of the time, at least in terms of each individual part of our cells, then obviously in total we can be. And up to the very moment uh, when we're no longer alive here on Earth, uh, our brains are putting, making new neural connections that allow us to learn new things, accomplish new things, and so forth. So I want you to, to really uh, become very aware of the principles that cause human beings to be perfect, perfect or near perfect, and as well as particularly the ones that allow groups of individuals. And then I want you to be prepared to apply those principles to each and every important activity you want to do as you develop your 2,000% solution. So I hope this has been an encouraging talk to you. Uh, this is my favorite part of the 2,000% solution. It's great fun to think about what could be done uh, by applying principles that already succeed, isn't it? So I thank you again for your attention. Goodbye for now. Talk to you soon.